In Bangladesh, 112 sweatshop workers died in a fire on Sunday. The seven-story building was owned by Tazreen Fashions, and as I said, this fire happened on late Sunday. 100 bodies have been pulled from the rubble, while an additional 12 people died after jumping out of the windows to escape the fire and then being taken to hospital, and they later died in the hospital. Now, the fire department operation manager, Major Mohammed um, Mabub, said army, soldier, army soldiers uh, in assistance with border guards uh, contained the area around the fire to prevent uh, thousands of concerned family members from getting into the area and possibly uh, making it worse because a lot of them showed up. The families of these workers showed up when they heard about the fires and how many people died. Now, Bangladesh has some 4,000 4, garment factories, and many of them without the proper safety measures in place. Now, as a result of this, thousands of workers took to the streets in protest in the streets of uh, uh, Dhaka, a suburb of Dhaka, by throwing stones at factories and smashing cars. The rage of the public over the reckless disregard, disregard for the lives of the people who die was tremendously made manifest. Some 200 uh, factories were actually closed for the day as the protests erupted in uh, Savar. Now, the government announced Tuesday that it will be a national day of mourning with the flag lowered at half-mast for those who actually died during the incident. Now, the fire has definitely highlighted how completely unregulated the industry actually is and how the government has failed to protect the rights of workers by doing proper inspections and then following up on violations that they do find. Now the investigators believe that they have found the cause, probably found the cause of the blaze. A, a circuit uh, had caused the fire but said that the fire in itself, that it was not the fire in itself but the lack of safety measures in the building that actually made it so deadly had the proper safety measures been there there would not have been such an astronomical number of deaths from a building fire now this is what the fire chief had to say had there been at least one emergency exit through outside the factory the casualties would have been much lower now, according to some more information that has come out, workers actually tried to flee the fire, but were actually stopped by management who uh, gave them a false story about what was going on in order for them to continue productivity while they tried to put the fire out, as opposed to letting them leave because of the risk. Managers told us nothing happened. The fire alarm had just gone out of order. Go back to work, Ribu said. But we quickly understood that there was a fire. As we again ran for the exit point, we found it locked from the outside and it was too late. This is absolutely horrendous. This is absolutely terrible and shows the absolute complete disregard for human life. Tazine Fashions Limited is owned by Walmart, a subsidiary called the Tuba Group, neither of which could actually be contacted for comment. Now, the Tuba Group is a major Bangladeshi garment exporter whose clients include Walmart, Carefor, and IKEA, according to its website. So they are a major, major producer, and they are a major company. So they really had the resources to take care of any problems that were in the building. Well, with a company that size, they would certainly have the income capable of doing so. Now, Tazine was given a high-risk safety rating in May 16 of 2011, an audit conducted by the ethical sourcing uh, uh, assessor for Walmart had actually gone into the building and, and a document posted on the Tuba Group's website, but it did not explicitly specify what caused the rating. But they basically, Walmart's uh, people who go in and check these things, uh, that guy's been asleep at the switch for on human rights, I guess only what legal safety laws say, said that there was a problem. Now, the website didn't explain what that problem was that they found or why they felt that it was unsafe, but this has been going on since May 16th of last year, which means not only do they have the resources to take care of whatever the problem was, they've had more than a year to do something about it. I mean, you can't claim that they just didn't know. You can't claim they didn't know about it. You can't claim that they couldn't afford to do anything about it or any other kind of uh, free market BS. I mean, this clearly was an act of them just not caring. This was, it was completely the fault of profit maximization. 
any little tiny bit they can save to put in their own pocket, even at the expense of now 112 lives. Now, this is, this is so typical. This goes along with, with the line that we hear all the time, how it's the capitalists who take the risk, even though that's completely ridiculous given that most business is dominated by very, very large companies who then take whatever capital it is they're going to risk and spread it out through a multitude of smaller things, thus actually minimizing their risk to, well, almost nothing. But here it is, the workers, the people who have to go in every day, who live in the worst conditions, who work under the worst conditions, who are taking the biggest risks, their own lives, and that's actually what it costs them, are the people who are actually taking the risk, not the capitalists in this situation. He was sitting in a desk, most likely, in another country. Even if he was sitting in a desk in the same country in Bangladesh, you can damn well bet the, sa the fire safety was up to protocol. I'll bet his building isn't under the same kind of uh, dilapidated conditions that would lead to a fire like this. Now, I'll bet he's sitting in some like really, really comfortable, you know, nice office, pampered and taken care of, while the people who have to go in every day and to take the real risk are dead. And to think that this is what this is what libertarians want: no regulation. People should be free to do this whenever they want, and that. Oh, we could choose not to buy products from these places, which would imply that we would have any idea this is going on. But we had no idea. We didn't even know where these clothes came from. I mean, we wouldn't even know to look up the tuba group to find that place to know the safety conditions behind that building. We couldn't have known because we had no idea where it was. I'd never even heard of the tuba group up until now. I mean, this is, have no, have no illusion. This is what the capitalist class wants. They want to scale everything back to the early 1900s, to essentially this. This is what they want. A minimal amount of expenditure on everything in order to get a maximum amount of profits. And that, that tremendously includes safety, safety issues. That's one of the things that they're most resistant to getting, aside from, you know, union wages. But I mean, on top of that, this is the price of third world labor. Those of us in the first world who have a privileged position of being able to get commodities so cheap and cheap to the point where we're ridiculously wasteful of them, this is that cost. It's not just that minimal amount that comes out of your pocket. This is the human cost of that. Every one of those, quite frankly, sheep that went streaming into any store on Black, you know, Black Friday, when they went in there just under a drive of insane mindless consumption that fuels this that we in the first world are able to do that to act with such idiocy because people like these in extremely disadvantaged positions out of necessity out of the coercion of poverty have to put their lives on the line and in this case they didn't just get poverty they got death as well and the seemingly thousands of people that are going to suffer because of this tragedy, their families, their friends, their community, that's the price of first world privilege. But that's completely overlooked, of course. I mean, that, that doesn't really matter. I mean, we just ignore that because it's not us that has to pay the price. It's like the libertarians who support child labor and support sweatshops because it's never their kid that has to go through that, that has to suffer that and live it. It's always somebody else's kid that has to do it. And as long as it's somebody else's kid, then it's okay and it's completely justifiable. This is, above all else, the profit motive and what it does. You could not trace this back to anything more than the profit motive. If every single safety precaution had been put in place, if every measure to protect people's lives had been put in place, then you could genuinely really call this an accident that nobody could have prevented. But this literally, the people investigating it so far have said this happened because the proper safety precautions were not in the way and there literally wasn't an emergency exit. In fact, it was deliberately bound so that people could not use it. Nothing could demonstrate more the cost of the profit motive that we don't see that we don't normally see on a day-to-day -day basis that occurs much in a, in a much more acute sense in the, first, in the third world than it does 
here in the first world. This, this is the face of capitalism. This is the face of the mad drive to accumulate capital. This is the real face of first world privilege. And no amount of angry comments in denial in the comments section is going to be able to change that.